lesson today is to find the minimum and maximum values of quadratic functions, which of course we know are parabolas. We've already learned that there are three ways in which we can write an equation for a parabola. Each of these forms are all useful in their own way. Let's explore all three. The first is vertex form. It's written as f at x equals a bracket x minus h all squared plus k. One of the biggest advantages to being in vertex form is that we can find the vertex. The vertex is very useful. It's helpful in graphing and determining whether or not we have a minimum or a maximum value. The vertex can be found by looking at the h and k values in our function. Another huge plus to being in vertex form is that we can easily graph our parabola. And one method to do this is to use an RST chart. All of the transformations can be easily seen through the different values for the a, h, and k variables. Finally, we can always determine whether or not our parabola will open upwards or downwards by looking at the a value. If the a value is positive, then our parabola will open upwards, giving us a minimum value of the vertex. If the a value is negative, then our parabola will open downwards, which means that our vertex will be at the top of the parabola, or give us a maximum. Let's now look at our second form. Like the linear function before it, a quadratic function has a standard form, f at x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Standard form has a ton of uses, but mainly it's a middle ground between all three of the different forms. We're going to discuss a little bit later how we can get from one form to the other, but all of them normally start from standard form. An immediate use to standard form is by looking at the c value. The c value is the y-intercept on our parabola. Standard form is also useful when we need to solve for x, as we can plug the a, b, and c values into the quadratic formula. And just like vertex form before it, standard form can tell us the direction of opening by looking at whether the a value is positive or negative. Let's move to the final form. Our last form is factored form. f at x equals a bracket x minus r bracket x minus s. This form is useful for giving us our roots, or in other words, our x-intercepts, or the solutions, or the zeros. We find the roots by looking at the r and the s values in the brackets. It's sort of like backwards thinking. We see a bracket that says x minus 4, that means that we have a root at positive 4. Whereas if I had another bracket that said x plus 6, that means that I would have a root at negative 6. Once we know the roots, factored form is also useful for finding the vertex. Since we know the two roots are the x-intercepts, we know the axis of symmetry of our parabola has to lie halfway between them. And from there, we can take that x value of the axis of symmetry and plug it into our equation so that we can solve for the y value, which would give us our vertex. All three forms are useful in their own way. But since today's lesson is focused on the minimum and maximum values of parabolas, the form that might give us the most advantage is vertex form. Previously I said that standard form was sort of like the middle ground between all three forms, and that's true. We can get from standard form to vertex form, or we could go from standard form to factored form. But if I wanted to go from factored form to vertex form, or vice versa, I'd have to get back to standard form first. So to get from standard form to vertex form, we do a procedure called completing the square. And to get from standard form to factored form, well, just like the name says, we have to factor. We're going to look at an example of a quadratic function that starts in standard form. And we'll use completing the square in order to get it into vertex form. We're also going to learn a new method of finding a vertex from standard form called partial factoring, which might make it easier than converting it to vertex form using completing the square, especially for questions involving decimals and fractions. Here's our function we're going to work with. 
we're going to want to find the vertex by completing the square. f at x equals negative 2x squared plus 20x minus 42. In order to complete the square, we're first going to focus on only the first two terms in our standard form. With those first two terms, we want to get the x squared term by itself without a leading coefficient. So we need to factor out whatever number is in front of the x squared. For this example, that number is negative 2. We're going to factor the negative 2 from both the first two terms. So we'll put it on the outside, and what's left over is an x squared minus 10x. We're going to leave that negative 42 just sitting on the outside until the very end. Let's remember that our goal here is to get this into vertex form. Currently we have an x squared and a minus 10x inside the bracket. But with vertex form, we, not, we need our x value to not have that squared beside it. The squared actually has to go to the outside of the bracket. In order to do that, we have to find a perfect square trinomial to fit within those brackets. A perfect square trinomial is a type of trinomial that factors into two factors that are identical, or factors into a factor all squared. We need to figure out what the third term will be beside the x squared and the minus 10x in order to complete a perfect square trinomial. And to do that, we use this simple rule. Take the second term, that 10x you see, and divide it in half. That gives us 5. Then take that number and square it. 5 squared is 25. 25 is the number that we're going to add on to those two terms in order to create a perfect square trinomial. But mathematically, we can't just add 25 to a function and expect that the value is going to be the same. In fact, we've changed the value. We've added 25. So in order to offset this, not only do we add 25, but we have to subtract 25 as well. And we include that beside each other inside the brackets. This gives us four different terms inside the brackets. x squared minus 10x plus 25 and then another subtract 25 after it. Let's focus on those first three terms, our perfect square trinomial. This can now be factored to look like the x minus h all squared that we see in the vertex form. Getting those x and h values are easy. We just square root the first and third terms. So the square root of x squared is x, and the square root of positive 25 is 5. Now how do we know what sign goes in between the x and the h? Is it a subtract sign or an addition sign? Well, we find this out by looking at that second term in the bracket. If it's negative, then we're going to use a subtract sign. If it's positive, we're going to use an addition sign. So because we have a negative 10x, we're going to say that it's going to be a negative sign between those x and h values. So our factor will look like x minus 5 all squared. But wait. There was also that negative 25 that we left out. Where does that go? It's no longer included in those brackets. So what happened was it had to leave the brackets. In math, anytime there's something in brackets, it's always multiplied by a number that's in front of the bracket. In this case, the negative 2. So if we want to take that negative 25 and make it leave the bracket, I have to multiply it by the negative 2 first. Negative 2 times negative 25 is positive 50. And we'll put that positive 50 outside of the bracket. All of the hard work is now done. The last step is to clean up those two outside terms. And now we're going to bring back that negative 42. So our final function will look like negative 2 bracket x minus 5 all squared. And then positive 50 subtract 42 is positive 8. So we'll have plus 8 at the end. Now we're in vertex form. And from here, we can easily read what the vertex is. Remember, it's just the h and the k value. So in this case, our h value is 5. Remembering it's always backwards thinking when we're looking inside the bracket. And our k value is 8. So our vertex is 5, 8. Now I'm going to show you a different way to find the vertex by a method that we call partial factoring. Again, this might be an easier way to solve for the vertex. 
it won't get you into vertex form. But if we're not graphing the parabola, then maybe we don't need to be in vertex form. Maybe we only care about finding the vertex. Partial factoring is perfect. To start partial factoring, we only care about those first two terms, the negative 2x squared plus 20x. That negative 42 doesn't even matter. We're going to write negative 2x squared plus 20x off to the side and set it equal to 0. This is where the term partial factoring comes into play. We're only going to factor a part of our original standard form function. When we look at negative 2x squared plus 20x, our goal here now is to solve for an x value that makes this equal to 0. So to do that, we want a common factor. When we did the completing the square step, we factored out that negative 2 that was in front of the x squared. But now we want to factor out the negative 2 as well as the x, because both of them are common to both of those terms. We're left over with negative 2x times x minus 10, all equal to 0. Now let's solve for x. In this case, we have two different chunks. We have a negative 2x multiplied by an x minus 10. In order to get this equal to 0, either of those chunks can equal 0. So what value of x will make negative 2x equal to 0? Or what value of x will make the x minus 10 bracket equal to 0? These you can easily see by inspection x will either equal 0 for the first chunk or positive 10 for the second chunk. These two x values now form the basis for where we can find our axis of symmetry on our parabola. We know that the axis of symmetry divides our parabola into two equal halves. So if I have an x value at 0 and an x value at 10, the axis of symmetry has to fall exactly halfway between. And that's kind of easy to see here, where the axis of symmetry will be at x equals 5. If you had x values that weren't whole numbers, you may just have to add up the two x values together and divide by 2, or find their average. But this one was easy to do by inspection. So remember our goal here was to solve or find the vertex by partial factoring. And now we've already found the x value of the vertex. x is, ne x is 5. So how do we find the y value? Well, we can use our original quadratic function that's written in function notation. We just set x equal to 5 and then solve. And that will give us the y value of our vertex, or our optimal value. So setting x equal to 5, we get f at 5 equals negative 2 times 5 squared plus 20 times 5 subtract 42 which equals negative 2 times 25 plus 100 minus 42. Negative 2 times 25 is negative 50, so this will all end up equaling positive 8. And look what we have. When x equals 5, y equals 8, which was our vertex that we found when we were completing the square. Some people find partial factoring to be much easier than completing the square. You don't have to find a perfect squared trinomial. It might be, l you might be less likely to make a mistake. Sometimes people just like completing the square better. But completing the square can get tricky if we have decimals or fractions. Partial factoring is normally pretty easy. Just look at the first two terms, make a common factor by taking out the coefficient in front of the x squared term and the x and creating two chunks. Then set each chunk multiply together equal to 0, and figure out what makes each chunk equal to 0. That gives you two x values where you can find the axis of symmetry by finding the halfway point. From there, take that axis of symmetry's x value, plug it back into the original function, and solve for the y value of your vertex. And there you have it. And now you've seen the basics for finding a minimum or maximum value of a quadratic. You need to convert a standard form equation into vertex form, or use partial factoring in order to solve for the vertex. From there you can determine what the minimum or maximum optimal value is, which is pretty useful when we're doing questions that involve trajectories, or cannonballs, or divers, or underwater sea treasure exploration. Many problems can be formed from the world of quadratics.
quadratics. And hopefully this will help you on your way. Ooh.